not only is this a new world that you've introduced into fifth edition, but it, this is, is a full campaign setting well, with multiple subclasses, a completely new class for the first time, and then a whole bunch of like, you have basically a new, uh, an added background with, with patrons. You have a lot of content in this singular book. Yeah, so we, we got our feet wet last year with Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica with doing a campaign setting, uh, but this one's even bigger. Uh, because, yeah, Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica uh, had the monsters, the magic items, talking about the world. Uh, but it was sort of like if that, if that was um, cranked up to 10, Eberron Rising from the Last War is cranked up to 11. Uh, because not only is it a longer book, but as you say, it has a whole new class. It has uh, the group patron uh, section. It has even more DM hooks. Uh, so... Yeah, it is a lot, and uh, this, this book has been occupying us uh, for over a year, um, and, you know, it's, it's one of those things, we're always working on things way in advance, and then we just, you know, we keep our, <laughs> our mouths shut, yeah. um, and so it's been, it's been a lot of fun working on this, and this has been a hard one to not talk about, uh, because it has been so fun uh, to work on it, so I'm glad we finally get to talk about it and that this November people will be able to get their hands on it. What is the name of the book? It's Eberron Rising from the Last War. Why is it called that? It's called that because um, we really made an effort throughout the book to stress that defining feature of what this world is, that two years ago, the world came out of a war that lasted for 100 years, and there's no part of life in Eberron that hasn't been touched and shaped by that. Basically, it's sort of like the rubbing the sleeps from their eyes mm -hmm. as they, they step out of this decades-long war uh, that could have destroyed everyone. And because of that war, because of all of these nations spinning up their magical industry, they're now in peacetime, but with magical inventions that the world didn't have before. Uh, you know, the world now has uh, lightning trains, plentiful airships, warforged people who were created to be simply soldiers in the war suddenly have independence. They have souls and have to find a place for themselves in a post-war world. All of these elements weave together as people embark out into the world to essentially find out what ancient things survived the war, what happened to my loved ones, is my hometown even still out there? And the meeting place for so many of the amazing elements in this setting is the city of Sharn. Sharn is this wondrous fantasy metropolis with skyscrapers that pierce the clouds airships soaring amid its, its mighty towers, and people from all over, the, all over the world gather there. It's essentially the New York City of Eberron. Uh, but New York City, again, with airships, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, monsters walking around, magic everywhere. You can imagine- Gravity is a bit different. Yes, thanks to, thanks to elemental magic that is uh, plentiful there, uh, many things function in wondrous ways in the city of Sharn. And so we imagine that the city of Sharn will serve as a home base for many people. Uh, in fact, there is a first level adventure in Eberron Rising from the Last War set in the city of Sharn, meant to be a way to get you started. And you could then, once you play through that adventure, play through an entire campaign just in that city, or you could venture out into the broader world to again find out how did the war affect everybody? What's left? Uh, the book also includes various uh, playable races. It also includes rules for being a member of one of the great dragon marked houses. The dragon marked houses, for anyone who's unfamiliar with Eberron, are essentially corporations. Uh, but uh, corporations run by families that are united by these things called dragon marks. They're essentially these magical tattoos that appear on certain members of the family, and these marks have in them different magical abilities. Mm -hmm. 
People got to see some of this content last year in the, our DMs Guild uh, book, The Wayfinder's Guide to Eberron. And if a person is wondering, well, what's the difference between these two products? Well, if you look at just simply the number of words in the two of them, uh, Eberron Rising from the Last War is over two and a half times longer than Wayfinder's Guide to Eberron. If people just compare the number of pages, that's misleading because the pages don't have the same number of words on them. Right. <laughs> so again, this book, Eberron Rising from the Last War, is 320 pages. So it is the size of one of the core rule books of the game. It is jam-packed. What excites you about Eberron? Like, what was fun for you to be working on this new book? What really excites me about Eberron is just the tone and feel of it. Um, it's, uh, uh, we've always talked about it as a combination of sort of pulp adventure and noir intrigue. Um, so like the campaign that I ran years ago involved sending the characters off into ancient ruins in a very Indiana Jones heroic sort of way. But then behind the scenes was an agent of the Order of the Emerald Claw who was posing as an ally for them and a, a mentor and a patron for them and turned out to want their things for nefarious purposes. Um, so that blend of we're doing awesome adventure stuff in lots of really dramatic landscapes with all these forces working both behind the scenes very subtly like the Dreaming Dark and sometimes very overtly. Um, For those that don't know, what is the Dreaming Dark? The Dreaming Dark is a, a force of evil that lurks in the plane of Dalcor, which is the plane of dreams, um, hence the Dreaming Dark. And a force of darkness. Yeah, that, that pretty much sums it up. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, so the race of Kalashtar, which we saw in the Wayfinder's Guide, um, are sort of fugitives um, from this force. The, uh, the quarry dominate the continent of um, Sarlona across the sea, which we don't really see a lot of. Uh, but their agents are over in Corvair doing mischievous stuff and sneaking their way into dreams and hunting down the Kalashtar and all sorts of good stuff. There's two additional planes of existence within Eberron. There's a whole bunch. Okay, so what are the different planes of existence that exist within the Eberron universe? Eberron exists within its own sort of microcosmology. Um, the story that we crafted in, in the Wayfinder's Guide, uh, Jeremy Crawford and Keith Baker mostly worked out together, was that um, it, w it was intentionally sort of hidden away to keep it safe from the extra planar forces like Loth and uh, Asmodeus and all these things that Groomsh um, that love to get in and meddle with mortal races and even gods like Moradin or Corallon or Pelor. Um, so it, it's, it exists in this little bubble, but then you have the material plane, a, a micro material plane there, and these other um, small planes that orbit around it. So there's Fernia, the Sea of Fire, there's Risia, the Plane of Ice. Um, they don't correlate directly with uh, planes in the standard D&D cosmology, and so there's a weird thing where demons and devils and angels who all have a fiery theme might all live in the plane of fire rather than their own separate planes. That doesn't mean they get along. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so the, the origins of uh, celestials and fiends and elementals are, are not necessarily what you're used to. We talk about the possibility of uh, the Ring of Sybaris, which is this, this ring that surrounds the world of Eberron, of it being breached and something from another D&D world getting into Eberron, or vice versa, someone from Eberron getting out into other D&D worlds, right. uh, which is actually the case uh, for uh, the NPC Vi, I actually play in Acquisitions Incorporated, this hasn't been revealed yet in Ack Inc., but I can reveal it here. She is actually originally from Eberron. Oh, nice. Uh, and and uh, I won't reveal yet how she's able to do it, but it is actually because of something that is a part of Eberron's story that she is able to slip into other worlds. Uh, and, and that, I think, it, it's going to be fun for people to explore whether they want to keep Eberron sort of tightly contained within itself or they want to explore the possibilities of things from the other D and D worlds creeping in. Like which, you can imagine, which some I of, love. <laughs> you can imagine some of the big bads 
that threaten other D and D worlds. Yeah. Suddenly realizing there was this other world that was hidden away, uh, because the story we tell is that the progenitor dragons hid Eberron away from uh, various forces in the D and D multiverse, but. It's the, if the DM decides to go this direction, those forces might have found it. And you can imagine somebody like Asmodeus or Lolf right. uh, worming their way into this world in this that just emerged from this catastrophic war and maybe causing some new trouble. Now the thing is, is Eberron has plenty of threats of its own. So if a person wants to focus on sort of the homegrown threats in Eberron, right this book has them covered. Uh, something else this book has is a bestiary. We have a chapter of monsters, and among those monsters, we also stat out some of the really big bads of the setting. I mean, there are people familiar with Eberron would expect us to stat out the Lord of Blades, and uh, who is the, basically the leader of a group of warforged who want to uh, Violently, if necessary, form a place for themselves in the world. The Lord of Blades is there. But we also even stat out some of the mythical overlords, the fiends uh, who in Eberron's stories have often thought to be behind many of the world's greatest evils. A couple of them get statted out. Some of the, the horrific Dalkir are statted out in this book. Uh, so there are plenty of awful things for people to oppose in their Eberron campaigns uh, without going you know, to yeah, the yeah. broader multiverse. <laughs> but if you bring in those things, I think you know, you're, yeah, yeah. you're, you're going to make a, a pretty amazing uh, story mix. If you want to make enemies, there's plenty of enemies in Eberron already. You don't need yeah. to leave to find some more. <laughs> yeah.